close the hearing on 1345 and I open the hearing on 1609. I ask if there is anyone here who would like to speak on 1609 that they submit um, their pink cards now. Um, in this committee we alternate as much as we can people who are in support and opposed and if you don't get your card in then I can't do that in a reasonable way. We have a lot of people who want to speak and I would ask that you do not repeat the testimony. Uh, you can just say I agree with what was said by so and so and that's fine. We make note of that. Uh, the chair is delighted to recognize the sponsor, or Representative Warden from Hillsborough 39, to speak in favor of the bill. And the sponsor is delighted to be here with you, Madam Chairman and members of the committee. Thank you, Mark Warden from Hillsborough District 39. This could be one of the most important bills of the year for this legislature. Many people across the country are actually watching this to see what happens in New Hampshire. It's a great op opportunity for all of you, all of us, to restore some justice to the justice system and to protect property rights and reinforce the, con the concept of due process of law. <clears throat> the purpose of this legislation is to preserve disincentives to criminal activity by maintaining the economic loss to those bad actors and criminal offenders, but also to ensure that civil asset forfeiture is not allowed. What we're aimed, what we're aiming to do is to end the misdirected corrupting influences of civil asset forfeiture. Civil asset forfeiture is the power of law enforcement to seize and keep property suspected of being involved in criminal activity. That's suspicion of the property being involved. With civil asset forfeiture, unlike criminal forfeiture, law enforcement can take cash, automobiles, even buildings and residences without even charging <coughs> the owner with a crime, much less convicting him. In civil asset forfeiture, people are deemed guilty, I'm sorry, yeah, they're deemed guilty until proven innocent, it's backwards. If police have suspicion of a crime that, that property such as cash or cars or computer, com, computer equipment are involved in uh, the crime, they can just seize it and then it puts the rightful owner in the position of having to sue to get it back. So this bill requires that a person must first be convicted of a crime in criminal court before his property can be forfeited. None of your constituents will lose their property on the mere suspicion of a police officer. There are many horrendous accounts of police departments, prosecutors, and federal agencies seizing money and other types of property, deposits, cash, uh, on people who have never been found guilty. You'll hear two such harrowing uh, stories today. Many of these instances, instances stem from so-called adoptive forfeitures, where the local PDs discover what they think is low-hanging fruit and then turn the case over to the federal government, typically the DEA. They turn it over to the feds for prosecution in hopes of receiving a percentage of booty from seized assets. This is a very corrupting process and it gives perverse incentives to law enforcement to look at monetary gain instead of public safety. We must remove those dangerous incentives and hold New Hampshire to a higher standard. 1609, this bill is the result of a thorough and time-consuming study committee conducted by this committee two years ago under HB 1682 in 2012, the issue was studied very carefully by Reps Guida, Bowers, McGuire, Cohn, and others. They had six subcommittee meetings, hours of testimony from the general public and stakeholders, and at the end of it, the committee recommended unanimously um, recommend for legislation. So, of course, it was the end of a two-year term. It didn't go anywhere, but I've picked up where that committee left off. Uh, this issue is truly nonpartisan. Diverse groups such as NHCLU, Institute for Justice, National Association of Criminal Defense uh, Lawyers, Cato, and Alice from University of Wisconsin endorse these statutory changes. Remember that a lot of this has to do with the so-called war on drugs. 
as we've seen here in New Hampshire, as we slowly move towards liberalization of the laws against marijuana, um, as you mentioned earlier, Representative, we're seeing that there's a different approach, both at the local level, state level, and federal level about uh, drugs. So what we want, somebody mentioned earlier that prosecutors are worried about losing money for the drug task force. I think it's important for this legislature, if they deem that drug task force or any other drug, penal, uh, drug enforcement is a priority, then they should fund it that way in the budgetary process. But we should be removing these corrupting incentives to go about it with civil asset forfeiture. So I know there are a lot of people here to speak. I'll cut it where there, and I really appreciate your interest. Thank you very much, Representative. Are there questions for the sponsor? Representative Birch has a question. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I guess preliminarily, I, I have a number of questions about particular features of this bill, and I don't know if you're prepared to speak as to them because it looks like you put a lot of work into it. I appreciate that, Representative, and I do have my research assistant who will be better prepared to answer the specifics. If I'd be happy to defer to him if you can wait, but I'll, I'll do my best. I have the bill in front of me, and I certainly know uh, the and points. Also, uh, Representative, you probably are aware of uh, who a number of people in the room are, and it might be that they are better positioned to answer some of uh, Representative Birch's questions. So, you know, be sure to... I appreciate that. For the sake of uh, your sanity, I, I coordinated with a lot of people testifying to break it up so that we would not repeat the subjects and let them speak uh, on their areas of expertise and, and knowledge. So, I thought you'd enjoy that. And uh, you did say that you had written testimony. Yes, ma'am. Could we have it? I learned something last time I was in this committee room. I hole-punched the, <laughs> the testimony oh. this time. Yeah. <laughs> I'm trying to suck up. Uh, That's a good <laughs> you made your way into my box. Thank you so much. Um, uh, perhaps, Representative Burke, would you want to proceed with questions, or do you want to go to the people who have expertise? Yeah, it's difficult because I don't know what Representative Board knows. So. Representative well, if you, Borden, are you planning to stay here for this? Yeah, I'll, I'll be here. If, if, if you want to go ahead and so ask me and I say, happy. I don't know, ask uh, Mr. Corrigan or somebody else, I, I'd be happy to, you know, punt. Either way, All right, well, let me just get one or two if I put them off my chest. Um, one of the provisions of this bill, which was alluded to in the prior year, uh, says that um, allows that forfeitable property um, may be used by defendants to pay for legal representation in criminal proceedings. If I'm your, your local heroin dealer, and I have a big box of cash in my house that's labeled heroin proceeds, and the police come in to arrest me and, and grab that, and I say, well, 40,000 of that I want to keep so I can pay for my criminal defense lawyer. Um, I know if I were that lawyer in where I've been licensed to practice, I'd be disbarred from doing that, accepting that money. Is this an effort to say that the state of New Hampshire would believe it legal for a lawyer to knowingly use the proceeds of of uh, illegal drug transactions as a uh, fee? I appreciate the question. Thank you. I believe that in this bill, our main intent is to end civil asset forfeiture. With criminal proceedings, keep in mind that all defendants may have access to a variety of assets. Maybe they have a 401k program. Maybe they have rich, uh, a rich uncle who wants to fund them. Maybe they have other assets that aren't labeled that they can use for their, their own defense. And since most heroin dealers probably don't label it drug proceeds, um, I think it should be the burden of the state to prove that it was actually involved in illicit, illicit um, activities before seizing that property. But if I may follow up, yeah. if, if I'm correct, and I'm looking at page four of the bill, uh, at least from my, line 34, that even if it's identified, let's say through a court hearing, as being drug money, 
I would still, if I were the defendant, be able to use it um, in the meanwhile to pay for my criminal defense. I think every person should have his day in court, and I think um, defendants have a right to be to have counsel in their defense. And have a right to pay for it with illegal drug money. I'm not saying that. You said that. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. I, I have others. But Thank please. you very much. Um, Mr. Pronger, you did not specify whether you were for or against the bill. Was that oh. correct? That is correct. Um, the chair recognizes the state treasurer. Thank you for that. Who is not taking a position on the bill and Correct. just giving us information. Correct. <clears throat> Good afternoon, Madam Chair. It's a pleasure to see you. Uh, for the record, <clears throat> my name is Catherine Preventure. I am your state treasurer. Um, recently became aware of the bill because I have a, an outstanding coworker who scans every bill for the word state, state treasurer. <laughs> um, this bill did not come to the treasury for a fiscal note, and it requires the state treasurer to, um, if through the court process, and I'm not getting into any of the policy of forfeiture, I know nothing about that, but it requires the state treasurer to return the stolen property to its owner or to sell property at public auction. Um, I would prefer the state treasurer not be responsible for that. The state treasurer has absolutely no experience or um, resources to do that. If that <coughs> were required, Absolutely, I would need to put a fiscal note on this. Um, there, there were just a couple other questions. I wasn't certain um, if the bill talked about provisional title and when the property was seized, the state would hold and protect the property. And the state entity with custody of the property, I don't know who that is. If it's the treasurer, that's another uh, area that would require resources on the part of the state treasury if, if we if the treasury were to be responsible for holding property before there was disposition so um that's really all i want i don't know what the current process is i'm guessing somewhere there's a process that property is um, held by a law enforcement agency i don't know why that needs to change but um the, the state treasury is currently not equipped to, to do what this bill requires. Madam Treasurer, don't you think that the state could get the flow in any assets? The resources necessary to do this would, in my opinion, far exceed any float. And I can tell you in this interest rate environment, it would not be worth any float that we might, especially if there were other than cash, you know, if there were, I, I'm not, you know, if there were property, it talks about land and buildings and maybe vehicles and firearms, and I don't, I'm not sure who would have custody. I'm not sure who the state entity is that would have custody, but then the treasurer would be responsible for presumably hiring an auctioneer to liquidate the property, or it says return stolen property to an owner. So if we were to proceed, with this bill, it would be the hope of the state treasurer that the state treasurer was not part of the process. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Are there any questions? Yes, Representative Cavalier. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you for taking my question. I, I loved your testimony. I just don't understand why you uh, just don't say I oppose the bill. Well, because I don't know. I can't take a position on civil and criminal forfeiture, and I, I don't want to say I oppose the bill or support it because I don't really know anything about the policy behind it. If the bill were to pass out of committee, I would just suggest that it needs a fiscal note. That I'm not saying the Treasury couldn't do it with resor resources, but I can tell you right now, it, it would be impossible for the Treasury to, to undertake this effort. Thank you very much. Thank you for taking the time to be here. And I commend your assistance for finding um, no other questions. The chair recognizes uh, Ann Rice from the Attorney General's office. Uh, 
to oppose this. Thank you. Good afternoon once again. My name is Ann Rice. I'm the Deputy Attorney General. I'm we oppose this bill. Um, this bill is much broader than the one that you just heard. Um, uh, it, it establishes an entirely new process for forfeitures. And the concept of the process, I don't really have a dispute with. I, I think it, it makes some sense. Um, however, there are some things in it that I'm a little concerned about. But I, I need to, to answer or respond to a couple of things that were said um, in describing the process in New Hampshire. We do not have what is described as a civil asset forfeiture proceeding here. It is a civil judicial process. It doesn't go to a criminal trial. But there has to be a court proceeding in order for someone's property to be taken. We cannot, the law says, you cannot take someone's property without a conviction. So to suggest that that's not the case here, I think, is important for me to make um, there was also a suggestion that under the current law, the rightful owner would have to sue to get their property back. And that's not correct. Under current law, if we are going to um, forfeit property, there has to be a notice posted in a general publication. There are a number of places that it gets posted. Uh, anyone who has an interest in the property can file something in court so that they have the right to a hearing on it and the court will decide if, if people have an interest in property. But we can't just take property and hold it. If it's contraband, that's a different thing. If it's marijuana and it's still illegal, then it's going to get hold and it's not going to go back to property. But if it's, if it's something that's not contraband and we haven't forfeited it through a process, we cannot hold it. <clears throat> I need to make those things clear. Concerns about this, I can't speak to all of the money de details about this bill. We have a couple of people in our office that are much more familiar with the forfeiture process who I'd be happy to make available. Our concern is, first off, that it, it takes away the money, as did the other bill. It takes away the money from law enforcement. And again, we're talking a small amount of money in the state process. But what this also does is say that any federal forfeitures would have to go to the state to the state general fund. Federal forfeitures bring in, uh, I believe in 2010, it was a million plus dollars that went to local and state law enforcement agencies through the federal forfeiture, drug forfeiture process. So that's a million dollars that would be taken out of the hands of law enforcement for drug enforcement activities if this bill were to pass. It would, what the bill says, it would have to go to the general fund. Well, in fact, any money that is forfeited under the federal process can only be used specifically for law enforcement purposes. And so it would, could not go into the general fund and be used for anything other than law enforcement purposes. So that's where our concern lies. Is you are, again, this would take money out of local law enforcement's hand. Um, when I was talking to the, uh, the attorney who handles these things over at USDOJ, he said that there are times where we have had agencies whose entire, all of their cars and all of their ammunition and those sorts of things have been funded through drug forfeiture money. So it's a real help to the, to the local law enforcement. Um, you know, the small amount of money that the state gets should be an indicator that this is not a corruptive influence um, on law enforcement. It is not a huge thing. It is money that's helpful to the state. Though. So I, I oppose the bill for those reasons. If the committee is inclined to look at the process, I would really like to be able to have an opportunity to bring in the folks that are more familiar with the actual drug prop forfeiture process to do it in our office. We're the only ones that do it in the state. And I'm happy to answer any questions. And I, I'm, I'm a little troubled by the testimony that the agencies depend upon this money, so we have to keep on doing it because that's how they get their money. It seems to me that we ought to decide whether that is an appropriate way 
for them to be funded, for their bullets and vests and whatever else it is to be funded. And maybe there's a more appropriate way to fund. So I'd like to, in my mind, I'm trying to separate that from the core question of what actually is the process. And, you know, there's been confusion already, I think, about whether if, in fact, in the end of this whole thing, someone were to be found not guilty, whether the property would be available in the first place, or whether, you know, I mean, though those are the kinds of questions that I'm worried about here, and I would leave it to our friends down the hall to figure out how best to fund local and state uh, police and other bodies um, if they weren't to get this money. I, I'm really just interested in the, the core issue of the principle of civil forfeiture as against civil forfeiture. And I, I want to make sure that I'm clear. Is if we don't have authority either by because it's contraband or we have an order of the court saying forfeit it, we can't do that. We can't hold it. We have to get it give it back. Now we may have there may have to be a debate on who's the rightful owner. But so now I don't know all of the federal law in that process, and I'm sure that we could get someone in here to talk about that. If if you're interested in the process. So your but your testimony is that you don't hold, or the property is not forfeited unless there has been an appropriate judicial determination that the property should be forfeited. Yes. The or property. if the if the uh, person involved has waived. So the property may have been seized. Property will be seized prior to. But if a person is found if a person has not waived the forfeiture proceedings, but we go through these and there's a determination that um, this is not <coughs> connected, there's no nexus to drug transaction, or it's, it's uh, th this forfeiture is far in excess of what the nature of the criminal conduct was, those sorts of things, the person gets the property back. Okay, thank you very much. Are there any questions? Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, and I understand the limitation somewhat in your testimony offer to provide uh, other individuals as necessary. Let me ask you about one section you might be able to comment on. I'm looking on page 12, uh, starting at line 20. Uh, as I understand, uh, in general, uh, uh, drug investigations that uh, state or local in, uh, law enforcement may start a case and at some point turn it over to the federal government uh, due to resource issues or uh, other issues. Uh, this section would appear to say that uh, the, the putative defendant would have an opportunity to go to court and publicly litigate whether the, uh, the state agent, state or local agency would do the criminal investigation or the federal uh, government could do the investigation in a general sort of way. Would, would you say that makes sense to you that the defendant can go haul in the state and federal government and publicly litigate who's going to do the investigation? It's, it's a very novel concept. I, I don't think that it's a practical concept. Thank you. Any other questions? Representative Woodbury. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Attorney Rice, um, Representative O'Flaherty, and I, my previous bill, and I know you were here for that, uh, referenced a ranking put together by the Institute for Justice <coughs> in Hampshire and D in our neighboring states, much higher grades. Are you familiar with that study of that ranking? And, and I guess I'm going to ask, perhaps not you, but see if we can get a copy of it. I'm not familiar with that. Um, I'm, I'm certainly going to go back to the office and do a little research to see if I can find it. And if I do, I would be glad to provide it to the committee. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Oh, I, no, you're responsible. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, uh, you're welcome to sit at the table, but not to ask questions. Um, 
Any other questions? If not, thank you very much. And the chair recognizes Kevin Gordon to speak in support of the bill. Three minutes. Manchester representing himself. Good afternoon. Thank you for coming. Good afternoon, ma'am. I am a victim of the civil forfeiture law in New Hampshire. I was arrested and they took my vehicle the day I was arrested. I didn't go to court for almost a year afterwards. During that time period, I did not see or hear or know anything about what was happening with the vehicle. I did hire a lawyer to look into this for me and unfortunately he did not follow through what I felt was properly and I never did find out the facts about what had happened and why. Ultimately what happened is there was a plea bargain involved and the state put in the plea bargain that I was not to fight the forfeiture of the vehicle. And so I had my hands were tied at that point because I did take the plea bargain. Uh, my crime, by the way, was a known heroin addict who happened to be an acquaintance of mine came to me and begged me to help him out because he couldn't pay his rent for his wife and child. And he asked me to get some drugs for him because I knew where to get them. I don't use, by the way. And that's proof that when they did arrest me, they found nothing. I hadn't, there was no possession charges. There was a sales charge because this gentleman who was the heroin addict was arrested for heroin possession. And rather than take the responsibility of his actions upon himself, he turned confidential informant upon me and lured me in to helping him out based upon my contacts and who I knew. Um, what I really find inequitable about the law is the value of the materials taken, well, in my case it was my car, and the car had, was relatively expensive. It had been purchased for me by my sister as a gift, and I had proof of that. Um, it's not equitable from person to person for the same crime. The, you know, person A can be charged with a crime, person B can be charged with the same crime. If person's, person A's property is worth more, and in my case was paid for, and I had the title to the vehicle, they can decide which one to pick and choose to take. They don't have to take anything or they can take whatever they want pretty much because the law is very open-ended. Um, I called, I made phone calls to the Attorney General about this before I got my lawyer. I made phone calls to the state, to the governor, to try to find out how this was equitable and where my pro property was. They wouldn't even speak to me. It was an effort in futility and I find that the law is just not fair. Uh, I was, my, as I said, my property was taken almost a year before I was ever went, even went to court. And during that time, I had no knowledge of where it was and what was going on with it. When I got arrested, they towed my car away while I was at the police station and never even bothered to tell me what had happened to it, where it had gone. I had to make all the phone calls myself. So it was somewhat of a secret almost in my opinion. And I just wanted to come to this committee today and let you know that this law or policy or whatever it's been called today is not only inequitable but it's unfair from person to person. If, a, if person A and person B commit the same crime and they're convicted of the same crime, they get a jail sentence and a fine within a certain parameter. The forfeiture law does not work that way. They can take what they want, no matter how expensive it is, and they don't even have to give you a good reason why. And that's what I have to say today, ma'am. I appreciate the opportunity to come and speak with you. Thank you very much. We appreciate you taking the time to come. Does anyone have any questions? Thank you very much. Thank you, ma'am. For taking the time to be here. The chair recognizes Major Russ Conti from the Department of Safety to testify against the bill. 
and he has written testimony. He asked for five minutes, but he's going to take less than that. I'm going to take much less than that. Yeah. Thank you very much. Good afternoon again. Russ Conti from the Department of Safety, Division of State Police. I'm handing out the written testimony, but I will tell you that it, it is redundant to what, uh, what we spoke about with the last bill and some of the questions that, 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 uh, that I was asked. Um, although I can tell you that um, there is a couple of things we have confirmed since it was done, and I believe Deputy uh, Rice was here, and that is uh, likely that New Hampshire will no longer qualify for a share of federal forfeiture proceedings because the law requires that the money be used exclusively drug enforcement and treatment. That is true. Uh, meaning that if it's taken federally, it can't just go into the general fund and be used for anything. The whole purpose of, of seizing those assets uh, from illicit activity is to make sure that we can put it back in the fight. Um, uh, so that, that, that's one clarification I think is, is worth stating. Um, the only other thing I'll tell you that is, uh, the investigations uh, that are done by the state police, and we don't have a lot of people in drug enforcement. We have approximately 14 detectives that are uh, that are assigned to do drug investigations, and they do it at all levels. Um, uh, that that money that everybody uh, pull, pulls from with federal proceedings, with uh, federal charges, with forfeiture proceedings, is, is put to good use. And, and the only thing I will I will state is the obvious: if if there wasn't this activity going on, there would have never been probably a need to, to have forfeiture of, of illicit activities for drugs. That's where kind of the forfeiture proceedings really started. And it's really to curb the activity, whether it's you and its associate, is whether it's you or you know somebody's doing it, is to stop that from happening and to, and to modify the behavior. So I thank you for your time, ma'am. Thank you very much for bringing this to our attention. Any questions? questions if not um, the chair recognizes Dennis Corrigan um, to speak in support of the bill he has written testimony and he says he's representing representative warden he'll explain that um, <laughs> my research staff thank you madam chair uh, <coughs> members of the committee and distinguished guests I am, in fact, Mark Warden's research assistant on this bill and one other one we did um, um, a year or so ago. Um, in particular, I'm the one who figured out the details of what's in the bill, so I'm here to answer for those details. And um, I would just uh, beg your indulgence on that. I'm not a lawyer or a legal scholar. I didn't even stay in Motel 6. So, um, but um, I did, um, want to mostly, in fact, um, keep things brief by uh, leaving a lot of the stuff that's in the written testimony unsaid here, and um, really just concentrate on a couple of points that have come up in response to some other folks. The number one point I'd like to make today, and I think it's the most important point, it's the most important section of this bill, is the reporting section. It's about the requirement under this law that law enforcement agencies compile records of forfeiture activity, uh, the disposition of the, of the forfeitures, the details on how the money was spent, and so on. Because otherwise, without this data, I think it's very difficult for any interested parties in the administration or the legislature to make any kind of judgments on how um, this law is being administered. Now in particular, we heard two witnesses this morning talk about they had no idea of how much federal forfeiture activity there is that uh, they can't give statistics on uh, federal versus um, state forfeiture. Well, your own subcommittee in 2012, 1682 subcommittee on the first page of its report comes through with the, with the amazing um, statement as follows. I'll quote the subcommittee report. The subcommittee learned that out of approximately $1 million in property lost each year to forfeiture proceedings, only approximately 50000 is through New Hampshire forfeiture process, and the remaining $950,000 is through the federal process. And the subcommittee felt this disparity had important policy implications and was due to financial incentives that were, in the subcommittee's words, improper. In particular, when, the, when there is an adoptive forfeiture, when the uh, local law enforcement personnel go to the federal prosecutor and it's heard in federal court, the disposition of funds is 
um, to the federal government and 80% to the local law enforcement agency versus today's law in under um, RSA 318, 45% goes to the law enforcement agency. So there is a specific financial incentive for the, for the um, uh, situation to be uh, adjudicated in, in, um, in federal court. Whether that's uh, any factor in the consideration of the police officers, that's not for me to say, but I would urge um, the committee to consider giving more unequivocal moral guidance uh, to our police forces. I think we don't want to continue to offer incentives for that kind of behavior. Um, there was um, some talk about how the uh, uh, person has to go to a court case. There's no question that civil asset forfeiture involves a court case, um, but once once there, the um, the seized property has to effectively be um, um, uh, proved innocent um, by the, by the person who's, who's been subject to it. I just want to point out, I've got a press release here called uh, New Hampshire Earns D Plus in Policing for Profit Report. That was the reference that, that came up before. If that's helpful to you, I'd be glad to leave that for the committee. Um, the, we, we talked about uh, public defenders for asset forfeiture cases. Just to point out that it's only in the criminal process that, that public defenders are available, is my belief. And uh, under the civil asset forfeiture, there is no public defender um, possibility uh, at this stage. The we talked. Uh, there was many, many um, representatives had questions about return of property. The the key th the key element it seems in in many impractical cases I've looked at throughout the the, the country is really is the um, is the degree to which the property is encumbered with liens or debts. Uh, in, in Florida, for instance, um, uh, police seized a, 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 Cadillac, a Cadillac SUV in Escalade, and um, that ended up being returned because it had a big lien on it. Um, I'm not sure it would have been returned otherwise. Before you assume that I'm um, casting aspersions on, uh, in terms of financial motives involved, I would just like to point out that um, the um, uh, the, uh, the chief of the um, asset forfeiture um, element within the federal government has, in fact, uh, also um, made these made these made these comments. Um, Finally, in terms of the disposition of money, um, as the fiscal note shows, the, the dollar amounts remain the same. Uh, what's lost to the um, local uh, law enforcement or the um, revolving drug forfeiture fund is, is, is a boon to the, um, uh, the general fund. I also find out something that's not been considered so far in the deliberations about money is, is the way that um, uh, there's a downside to performing forfeitures. You're going to hear from a minute, I hope, if there's time from Mr. Caswell, who we, we've asked to visit us from out of state. Um, in his case, the um, federal judge, the chief magistrate judge of Massachusetts, ruled um, that uh, all the, all the uh, defendant's costs would be borne by the state, and that involved a half million dollars of, of um, defense expenditures to um, eventually to um, uh, get, get him off of, uh, of his situation. There was some talk about um, whether it was proper for a defendant to um, have the ability to choose the venue almost um, for his case. I, I only wanted to urge um, the um, committee to look carefully at the language involved uh, about, um, about um, the court should grant a motion if it finds that the property is the only reasonable means for a defendant to pay for legal representation. At the court's discretion, the court uh, may order the return of funds property sufficient to obtain legal counsel, but less than the total amount seized and require an accountant. So we've tried to put some 
um, safeguards uh, around those, those sorts of situations. Um, finally, uh, in, in the written testimony, you'll see. I know, I said that twice. <laughs> this, is the, this is the final filing. Uh, the, um, I've given you some material in the written submission about a, a jurisdiction called Sunrise, Florida. I just want to point. We will, we will read that. I've thank you. Read that. Sunrise, Florida is not Manhattan. Appreciate it. I just want to point out, though, that two of the comments made there. A Miami attorney said, is it illegal? Is it improper? No, not under our current law. And, and the detective there is saying, I go by what the law is. And that obviously is in your daily wit, too. Thank you very much. For those Thank interested you. in the citation on this um, study, which is uh, from 2010, um, www.ij.org slash policing for profit is the citation. This is from a Virginia, a Virginia group. Are there questions? Yes, Representative Woodbury. Thank you. Sure, and your group, and I guess maybe mainly yourself, uh, did a lot of work and presented a very long and complex and complete bill on this subject, which I assume took quite a bit of time to prepare. Uh, my question is, as, as you're participating in the preparation of this bill, what input did you have from the law enforcement and prosecutors and communities so that, so that this bill may reflect both sides of that argument? Well, it's a fair question. I won't prevaricate. I had none, quite honestly. I, it, it did take a tremendous amount of work to consolidate this, uh, this bill from the uh, 1682 bill from, from 2012. But um, uh, the questions I had about how law enforcement personnel view things were really um, handled by consultation with uh, with, with lawyers um, who were frankly in, in favor of changing the law in this way. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank problem. you very much for your testimony and for all the work that you did on this. Is Mr. Zibble out in the hall? Yeah. <coughs> Madam Chair, Mr. Zibble said he had to go to another hearing. He's going to try to make it back later today. Thank you very much, Mr. Okay, then let's see if that changes my order here. Um, well, we'll just keep this way. Um, Mr. Bissonette from the um, New Hampshire Civil Liberties Union, speaking in support of the bill, written testimony. Three minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Here's the testimony. Thank you. Support. Mr. Zimmel would have been appointed to testify if he was not here, so rather than start throwing the cards again. Madam Chair, my name is Gilles Bissonnette. I'm the staff attorney for the New Hampshire Civil Liberties Union. Thank you for allowing me to speak today. And, uh, we are submitting some written testimony. Thank you so much for reading it uh, in advance. The NHCLU proudly and enthusiastically supports HB 1609. And frankly, that's because the current system with respect to civil asset, uh, asset forfeiture in this state is fundamentally flawed. And I know I'm going to be somewhat repetitive, but I think it, I will try to get into some of the nuance of both the current system and the new system that this statute attempts to create. I would like to tell you, Mr. Bissonnette, sure. that we will read the testimony. And so we don't need you to read it to us. What we do need is for you to make sure you focus on things that we haven't heard sure. or have been, haven't been able to consider. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I think the, the first point is one that I will simply just make as a conclusion then move on, because I know it's been covered quite a bit, including at the 1 o'clock hearing. Uh, the fact that this current, the current bill that's being proposed, 1609, does require a conviction. I think that is, that is essential. That is something that is different than the current system. That is different than the, the, the drug acid forfeiture uh, uh, statute that currently exists on the books. And in fact, as one case interpreting that statute has made clear, uh, no criminal proceedings even need uh, be brought. That is in the written testimony, and I'll move on. Uh, the second point that I think is critical with respect to the current bill is that um, is that the state must show this is again after a conviction by clear and convincing evidence which is a, mo a more robust standard than by, than the bar uh, by preponderance of the evidence standard that currently exists that the asset seized have some nexus to the criminal activity that was subject 
to the subject of the conviction. I think that is a, a fundamentally important distinction. I think it requires an additional layer of, re of review to ensure that a jury has had the opportunity to ascertain uh, that, of course, not only has there been a conviction, but the assets forfeited or the assets alleged to uh, 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 be forfeited uh, ac actually have some tangent, uh, uh, strong, in fact, nexus to the actual crime. Um, I also want to note, and uh, I didn't hear much, at least since I got here at 1.30, uh, HB 1609 provides some very robust innocent owner protections, and I think this is critical. Under current New Hampshire law, an innocent owner, and here we're talking about a spouse or parent, uh, uh, who seeks to prevent forfeiture of his or her assets has the burden to show she was not a consenting party to the defendant's violation of the law. This puts the burden on the innocent owner who may never have been charged with a crime, let alone convicted, to prove his or her innocence in order to save his property. HB 1609, uh, and this is in proposed RSA 61729, properly places the burden on the state to show by a preponderance of the evidence that the person claiming innocent owner status has actual knowledge of the underlying crime given rise to the forfeiture and was willfully blind to its commission. And I think this uh, very important principle that's a part of HB 1609 is consistent with the notion that New Hampshire citizens should be viewed as innocent until proven guilty by the state. Uh, one point that I think is critical, and I'm not going to get into the incentives issue that's been discussed, I think, quite a bit today, but one thing that I think is critical is that the current New Hampshire regime adversely impacts the poor. New Hampshire's asset forfeiture system was originally designed to ensure that crime wouldn't pay, but innocent people with little means can easily be swept into the system faced with the consequence of losing property with, uh, without, one, the benefit of counsel, two, having been charged with a crime, uh, and three, the due process protections normally afforded to those in criminal proceedings. As the system currently operates, a victim's option for recourse against the state is directly tied to their socioeconomic status because a victim must spend thousands of dollars to hire an attorney to defend against a state's civil forfeiture action. And I think, we, thankfully, we heard some of that today from Mr. Gordon's testimony. And I think what was particularly troubling, at least in my view, with respect to Mr. Gordon's testimony, is how civil asset forfeiture could be used to, uh, lev to acquire leverage in plea bargains. And that is something that we all, I think, need to be very mindful of. Uh, and again, I, I think Mr. Gordon's testimony was uh, uh, very salient on that point. Um, and I would note um, that uh, I would note that uh, other states have adopted some robust, more robust due process protections in their right to know law. This isn't a testimony, but I would uh, encourage the community to look at Maine, Vermont, and North Carolina that have gone a long way to improving due process protections. They may not be far enough but it's a good start, and if you're interested to see how other states have looked at it, I encourage you to examine those states. Thank you so much, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. Maine, Vermont, and North Carolina? Yes, thank you. Thank you very much, Jesus, and are there questions? Yes. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. In, in other testimony, people have uh, said that the a person who is charged can agree to a, allow the state to take their property. Isn't that, it, isn't that admitting guilt, or is that only if they're going to plead guilty to a charge, or how does that work? It's a civil proceeding, so it's entirely different from the criminal proceeding. So as part of the civil proceeding, um, an individual who is the subject of the forfeiture proceeding, just like I presume as in any civil case, can agree to uh, adopt the other side's position. In this case, it would be, okay, in the civil case, I'm not going to contest it, um, so you can have my property. So that's, yes, to answer your question. Follow up? Is, yes. this, is that, um, um, can that be used in their criminal case to say that they, are, they, they allowed the forfeiture so therefore they mm -hmm. already concede that they're guilty? And that, that's a great question. I presume in the example that you're, give, you're giving, this is in the context of a settlement, I would think that uh, a good lawyer, again assuming that this person's represented by counsel, would require that the state um, not use that settlement uh, in any subsequent criminal proceeding. Um, as to whether or not, in the absence of that language, it could be used in a future criminal proceeding, I actually don't know the answer to that, but I would assume that there be provisions in the settlement agreements for benefits that. Thank you, Mr. Burke. Thank you, Madam Chair. 
Uh, and thank you, uh, Mr. Bissonnette, for being here. Uh, amongst my many questions, you raised the question of burden, the issue of burden of proof for an innocent owner. So we have, uh, you know, Mr. Heroin Dealer, and he's made his $10 million uh, selling heroin to children. And he then take, buys his $10 million house and puts it in his wife's name, mm -hmm. okay? Um, as I understand the burden of proof, it says the state shall prove by a preponderance of the evidence, which is relatively low standard, less than clear and convincing. Uh, either A or B, and B was willfully blind to the uh, commission of the offense. Willfully blind, on the other hand, has within it the burden of proof of proof beyond a reasonable doubt. So the way this is set up, I would have to prove uh, by a preponderance of the evidence a fact to be proven beyond a reasonable doubt. And I just don't know, based on all the years I did criminal practice, how you prove something with two different elements of proof in the same sentence. Now, I don't know I would view willfully as elevating the standard of proof. Well, it's defined that way. Oh, is it? Yes. So where would that be, Representative Birch? If in the definitional section. So that's, so Representative Birch, I actually do think that is, that is an excellent pickup. That probably doesn't make sense to conflate two standards of proof. Uh, you know, I would be interested to know why that definition was put in place, but page, I can't. Page one. I, I actually just saw it. <laughs> But what I could, what I would note is that willfully does have definitions, of course, outside of the four pages of the bill that doesn't actually include uh, a, a, a beyond a reasonable doubt standard. It is a, a well-used term, uh, in, particularly in criminal practice, that just has to do with an elevated mens rea requirement vis-a-vis -vis intent, the intent of the defendant. I, I do have others. Thank you very much. Any other questions? Thank you very Thank much. Thank you, Madam Chair. The time. Oh. If there's none others from the committee, could I ask another question? Certainly. Thank you. Um, relating to the last testimony that we heard um, from the research assistant, mm -hmm. uh, he indicated that the court uh, had discretion in granting a motion to allow the defendant to use drug money, so to speak, uh, for his or her legal fees. Uh, looking at page four, line 31, um, that's not discretionary with the court, is it? Term shall. Well, shall shall isn't a discretionary term. I, I would I would admit that. Yes, Representative Birch. So uh, under. Yes. So under this bill, the court would have no choice uh, upon a proper showing uh, but to allow uh, a defendant to use identified uh, drug cash uh, to pay his or her attorney. So uh, that does appear to be the case on the face of the bill, but I just wanted to mention just a few points in response to that, if you don't mind. Um, that would be that I think the assumption that you're making uh, is one that is actually kind of like contrary to the assumption of this entire bill, which is that there is a presumption of in innocence. Now, of course, the government can, in, in these particular instances, temporarily seize the assets pending the, the conclusion of the forfeiture proceeding. There would be situations in which, uh, uh, situations in which that money could ultimately be reclaimed and then used to actually defend the individual in both the criminal proceeding and in the forfeiture proceeding. But there are some checks, and I do agree that those checks are, at least in my view, sufficient uh, to ensure that that money isn't going to be completely depleted in the event that ultimately that individual is found uh, li found criminally liable with respect to the forfeiture proceeding. And I can go into those a little bit, but I think the, the, the key, one of the key provisions I would point, uh, point out to the committee is that if the defendant has means to pay an attorney, he won't be able to reclaim the money. Subsec uh, uh, if, if the defendant has other means to pay for an attorney, he will not be able to actually reclaim the money that, um, that, that, was that was ultimately seized by the government. And I also would note that there are substitution provisions 
in the bill that do enable uh, the government to uh, seize assets in the event that, let's say they seize $100,000, but that money is needed to, pro to, uh, to provide an adequate defense, that money could go back actually to the defendant, and then the government could seize some other asset up to $100,000 as collateral. So I do think that provides some institutional protections to ensure that the government's interests are adequately protected throughout these proceedings. The last one. The last one, thank you. Um, and I'm not sure if you were present earlier when I asked uh, the question relating to when the decision is made between a state investigation of a drug case, let's say, and a federal investigation, this bill appears to give the putative defendant uh, the opportunity to litigate that sensitive decision in open court and have a role in determining uh, who's going to investigate him or her. Uh, is there anything in this bill that I'm not citing correctly? No, I think that's true, and I think the reason why that, I'm presuming, I don't want to speak for the drafters, but I'm presuming that that reason exists in order to provide a check to ensure that the state isn't relying on the federal forfeiture proceeding. In the absence of giving a defendant the right to uh, challenge a federal forfeiture, um, there may not be a proper enforcement mechanism to ensure that uh, the, the state isn't circumventing the, provision, the provisions in this bill. Just for clarification, we're talking about the investigation, not the forfeiture, the criminal investigation mm -hmm. itself, mm -hmm. that the defendant will be allowed to influence who does it. I presume, and, and I actually may defer uh, to the drafters for that question, but I, I'm going to guess that, uh, well, I'll just leave it at that. I don't have enough information to answer your question. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you very much for taking the time. Thank, Thank you. The chair recognizes Michael Sleck again. The New Hampshire Chiefs Association opposing the bill. Thank you, ma'am. Chief Slick from the Hampshire Chiefs Association, and again, we oppose this bill. Um, I don't want to go over a lot of the testimony, but I do just want to clarify a few things. Um, one, if you look at this bill, and there's been a lot of testimony today that police departments or police agencies are incentivized about going after these drug monies. But if you look at this bill, this bill gives drug dealers the incentive to continue carrying on business in the state of New Hampshire. And it protects their assets so that nobody can go after their developed gotten gains. Now, in New Hampshire alone last year, we had 164 drug overdose deaths, which was up significantly from the year before. This will continue to drive that business through the roof if we can't go after the dollars that they get illegally and continue to grow their businesses. Second, every forfeiture that is done, either by the state or the feds, Every defendant is given what they call a seven-day letter, and we can get a copy of that to the committee. It tells them where their vehicle, where their property is, who seized it, and that they have seven days to request a hearing on that to get their stuff back. So a lot of false information here about what goes on. There's hearings after hearings, there's attorneys involved. If, you know, we heard testimony earlier that a gentleman hired an attorney never heard back of him. That's ineffective counsel. And even an adult, follow up on that. Don't blame the cops because you just, you chose to take a bad, make a bad decision and your property got seized. We wouldn't be there if you weren't doing the illegal activity. We're not riding around our communities every day going, hey, he's got a nice house. I'm gonna look and see if he's swinging dope and go after it. It's crap. It's not how it works. Um, the other thing, as far as deciding, who does what as far as prosecution? There's a lot of situations where we'll get information from the federal government based on confidential informants or confidential sources, and then we follow up on that. And to have now the defendant be the one to decide which court that's heard from, it's absurd. It's absurd. It's again incentivizing illegal activity to continue, and it doesn't make any sense. For a case to be taken by the feds, there's certain guidelines that they have to do. You have to reach a certain amount of money, you have to reach a certain amount of marijuana or a certain amount of drugs. They just don't, I just can't call up the U.S. attorney and say, hey, I got an ounce of weed. You want to take this kid's house? It doesn't work that way. 
there's plenty of safeguards in there, safeguard and guidelines. As far as the forfeiture funds, if you take it federally, there's what they call the orange book. It stipulates what the forfeiture money can be used for. And if it goes outside the parameters, you have to get permission from the DEA or the U.S. Attorney's Office to do that. So we just can't spend it on whatever we want. Same way with state guidelines. If we take the money, there's certain things that we have to do to follow those guidelines. If we go out those parameters, we have to get permission to do so. So, um, so, and I think the last, the last thing is, the last time I dealt with a civil fortune was a couple of years ago. I think the, the breakdown was 60-40. Somebody had asked what the question was earlier about that. Um, so again, it, that's my concern. The laws we have now are adequate. There's a lot of safeguards in there. There's a judicial process that entails all these proceedings. And it's the individual that's involved in the ill-gotten Ill Ill gains to follow those and, and be apprised of what goes on. So. Thank you. Representative Kaplan has a question. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you for taking my question. How do you spell your last name, sir? S is in Sam. I-E-L-I-C-K-I. Comment spelling. L-I-C-K-I. Yep. <coughs> Thank you. Are there any other questions? Thank you very Thank much you. for taking the time to be here. The Chair uh, recognizes Brandon Guida who has written testimony. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I only have one copy of written testimony because I'm no longer a paid member of this body, so I couldn't afford these. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, the testimony I'm giving up is the subcommittee Actually, report. Doesn't that that you have probably more access to research. <laughs> <laughs> and I appreciate your service because yes it does. Um, <laughs> this was an enjoyable subcommittee. It was a, uh, I think it was a 19 page bill and uh, it was so detailed and it is so detailed that we broke it down into sections and we actually, we had a lot of hearings and um, we had the Attorney General in, we had all, the people that you've seen we saw and we even went beyond that by requesting data. And Representative Birch, um, it would have been uh, an honor to have you there with us because this bill is about checks and balances. Uh, but we thought that, uh, we came up with a unanimous subcommittee vote and a unanimous committee vote. Uh, on this, on this, on this bill, and we, uh, you bring up some very good points, and you would have been a great asset to the checks and balances. And I just encourage you to go forward with it. Um, some of the things I wanted to, to uh, the major points I want to make, and I'll be glad to take a lot of questions because I think I can remember most of it. Um, one of the problems that that bothered the the group was that there's a gray area of financing for law enforcement that is outside the normal budget and in, in one example uh, and I don't remember where there was a local law enforcement agency that actually got almost as much funds from forfeiture as they did from their town government and um, so we thought it was it's one it's much more proper to have it properly funded through normal legislative processes rather than create nobody can 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 say that there is there is not the at least appearance of impropriety and we'd want to avoid all those conflicts with our law enforcement I'm a law enforcement guy I'm a retired military officer but I'm also a civil rights guy and uh, we came up with a lot of balances here um, the, I want to I want to answer some questions uh, some make some statements about some questions that uh, from previous testimony also um, the reason we came up with the treasurer is because the state currently has two auctions per year where they auction off property and it goes into the general fund. It doesn't matter if it's a treasurer. What matters is that it's not a law enforcement agency or it's taken away from law enforcement so there's not an incentive to seize property um, and, um, and then, and, you know, for, for your personal benefit or for the agency's personal benefit. Um, I sat here, you know, in some of the testimony, I wonder when somebody, you know, why would somebody sign? Why is anybody in their right mind sign a forfeiture agreement before they're convicted? Well, it's obvious. Either they're being pressured, or they don't have a good education, or they don't have an attorney, which means they're maybe poor people or whatever. But 
in your right mind, I don't think anybody on this committee would ever do anything like that. Uh, I have been in a situation in another state, never been convicted of a crime, where I have been severely pressured, and it was New York State Police, severely pressured. And uh, I'm not the type of individual who buckles under pressure, but I think many people can or would. And, and we want to avoid that. Whether or not it happens, we want to avoid it. Um, what, what happens to federal money? Will it take away federal money if it goes to, if it's taken away from the police department? Well, Vermont was one of the other states uh, that we looked at. We looked at uh, Vermont. We, there were a number of states we looked at to get good ideas, said so they did it. And they give it to the state treasurer, or they give it to the state. So they're not losing out on federal funds. What, what the printed thing that we found was alarming here is that $50,000, I think it was already said by another witness, but $50,000 was through state process and $950,000 approximately was through federal process. Why? There's a greater percentage that you get back in the federal process than the state process. So is the incentive to maximize your gain or is the incentive to provide justice? So when, as an attorney, Representative Birch, or a, you were an attorney, and as a Christopher J. criminal law, when you look at the current statute, you'll see it's wide open and full of holes. And something has to be done, whether it is the 1609, um, and there were some things that were added to 1609, which I also thought were good, um, whether it's 1609 or something in between, something has to be done to correct this process. Um, there are a couple of just very quickly, there are two mistakes on page 12 that I found in the bill, um, and just to help you out, on line 15 and 16, it's just word mistakes. It's, uh, line 16 should say within five days, not with five days. And then on line 23, it says contrary to section, but there is no section should say section so-and-so. I'm and sorry, what line what? did you say? Line 23. Um, 22. 22. 22, I'm sorry. Contrary to section, yeah, okay. Right. Some of the things that bother me as a person, as a former rep, as even a law, law and order guy or whatever, is, is, is statements like this uh, and, and things that happen like this. I heard statements that the police return property expeditiously. But when, when I had a bill to return personal property in the last session, it was opposed by every police agency, and, mm -hmm. and they said, we do it, we just don't need it codified. Um, they said that um, we provide all exculpatory evidence. But when I tried, and we did, when we changed the law last session to mirror the United States Supreme Court ruling on police officer personnel fires being exculpatory evidence, it was fought every step of the way. So when I hear, hear some statements like that here, like we automatically we do it, then why in previous sessions, and possibly in this session, is there opposition, not, not, not the opportunity to work with them, but just pure opposition to these bills? So there's two sides of every story. I truly believe most of our law enforcement are law-abiding great citizens, but the, as in any profession, there is a percentage that we have to guard against. Um, the example that really bothered me last winter was when there was a murder up in Colebrook, or a, not a murder, maybe a murder, a 13-year-old girl who disappeared, and I don't think there's been charges brought yet. And the media was asking Deputy Attorney General Ann Rice, the boyfriend has not been charged but you've had his truck for over a year now. What do you intend to do that with that? And Deputy <coughs> Attorney Ann Rice, and I'll quote her as best I can, said, we're in the middle of investigation. We'll keep it as long as we feel we want to. And that's part of the problem, okay? With the resources we have today as far as determining what is evidence, what isn't evidence, and I, w immediately I thought, well, these weren't well-off people. They lived in an apartment. I saw the boyfriend on TV a year earlier in you know, intermittent periods, doesn't have a lot of money. What does that person do? What if that person is innocent, hasn't been charged? What does that person do with no vehicle when the top law enforcement officer of the state says, we'll keep your property for as long as we want? You know, Again, that's a little different because it's in the middle of an investigation, but it, uh, over a year had passed. It was more like 14 months. 
And that stuck with me since almost a year ago. That is part of the problem. Um, the sections that have been added were people who are here illegally and are deported. And I think those are fair sections. I didn't get to review them to see if, <coughs> as, you know, whether they needed to change. But I think it's a good thing because it, if you're deported, I believe the section gives it to your nearest of kin or whatever. It does something with the property rather than just assuming because you're an illegal alien you're guilty of the crime. Um, and that's, that's all. I, I think really that we spent a lot of time on it. I think unanimous decisions of the subcommittee and the committee, and I'm hoping that you can massage this even more and pass a really good bill. And I'd be glad to try to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Are there any questions for Mr. Guida? I wouldn't give you a marijuana back. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Madam Chair. It might be legal by the time. It's for my glaucoma. Thank you. Um, the chair recognizes Russ Caswell to speak in support of the bill. Thank you, Mr. Caswell, for coming. Thanks for having me. Um, I own the Caswell Motel down in uh, Tipsbury, Mass, and I've been victimized by these forfeiture laws. We did win the case in court, but the, the, way, the way this started is uh, we've been there. My father built the motel, and I bought it from him uh, in 84, and I've been running it ever since. And uh, we cooperate with the police all we, all we can in court and everything else. They even say we cooperate with them. They never accused me or anybody uh, at the motel that I have any control over or any of my family with anything. And uh, we... Uh, uh, deposed a bunch of the police. Well, let me go back a minute here. And I went over to the motel one day to get the mail, and uh, there's these forfeiture notices in there. And basically, what they said is, We're taking your property. And they listed these, at the time, it was about eight drug cases of people that they had arrested at the motel. It had nothing to do with anybody at the motel. These were people in their rooms that did some sort of drug thing. And I'm reading over these uh, cases. I never even heard of most of them. There was one of them I, I did know about. It was the police had arrested one of their own informants, and they're using that case against me. So, and I showed the people around the motel uh, and the people that worked there. Does anybody know anything about any of this? And nobody did. Nobody knew a thing about it. And so we deposed a bunch of the police that were involved in, in these cases thinking, well, something's going to come out here, because I'm thinking there's something went on here that I don't know about, or they're misinterpreting something. I was just dumbfounded by the whole thing. And uh, so we deposed the police, and about eight of them, I guess it was, and none of them had a thing to say against us. They all testified that we cooperate with them, we let them, uh, they come behind the desk and look at their records whenever they want. They hang around the motel now and then when they're not busy. We give them rooms for surveillance and whatever else they want around there. And they've just never suggested to us to do anything different. And the, the town has, has never sent us anything saying that we ought to be doing anything different. They give us a license to operate every year, have never said a single word to us about anything. So the one thing that did come out at the trial, at the uh, uh, depositions, was a DEA agent, Vincent Kelly. Uh, my lawyer asked him, what makes you pick one property to go after rather than another property? Because right in our area there, there's a Motel 6, there's a Home Depot, and a uh, Demoulis uh, parking lot, big parking lot, and they have far more trouble with drugs than we do. And the uh, DEA agent, after, after he asked him that, says, well, I, uh, I'm on the internet and I look for properties uh, that might have had some sort of drug problem. And then I go to the Registry of Deeds to find out who owns the property and how much equity they have in it. And my lawyer says, what's the equity position got to do with anything? And he says, well, we won't go after a property unless the owner has at least $50,000 worth of equity in it. Now, the motel is worth about a million and a half, maybe a little more, and it's paid for. 
So that right there tells me exactly what this is about. It's not about drugs at all. It's about going after people's property, stealing from the, the very people that they're supposed to be protecting. And so that told us that whole story. So then it gets ready to, to go to trial. And uh, well, we had a, an arbitration meeting before that where they, they call it uh, a settlement. Well, I call it more like an extortion plot. The, uh, Could I just interrupt for a moment? Sure. I know the story you're telling is very significant to you, but I just want to be clear. This has this happened in, in Tewksbury in Massachusetts. Massachusetts, but it was a Massachusetts federal. Massachusetts law. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm just, I don't want to interrupt you, but I want to know how that relates to the bill that we have. Well, it's the federal part. It's the federal part of this. The feds are the ones that were doing this. They went to the Tewksbury police and said, hey, this uh, motel here has had some drug activity there, and there's no mortgage on it. It's worth a million and a half dollars. I'm assuming this is what they said. And we're going to try to take it. And Tewksbury police would have got 80% of it, and the feds would get 20% of it. So it's not really to do with Massachusetts law or New Hampshire. It's the federal part that, that I'm talking about. course. And I, I guess that all of us are in the same boat on that. Yeah. But I just want to make do my best to make people aware of what this is. It's it's going after money from innocent people that haven't they never accused me of anything or anybody around there or anything. We got to court and uh, they use these vague insinuations well like he could have known or he should have known and that sort of thing. But when you press them well Specifically, what should you know? I mean, how, how am I supposed to look through a wall in a motel room and see what somebody's doing in there? They come up with nothing specific whatsoever. It's all this vagueness. And what they this went on for three and a half years. And what they do is try to break people. So you'll give in to them. Like uh, they were talking here about why would anybody give up their property? Well, the reason people would give up their property is because they can't afford to fight it. Like, say, somebody's taking your car or whatever from you. Car's worth a couple thousand dollars. You got to hire a lawyer for five thousand to get it. So a lot of people just say, "Yeah, keep the thing. It's cheaper to, to do it that way." And that's what this is all about: just uh, trying to break people so they can take their property. Anyway, in court, uh, the judge saw right through all this smoke and mirror stuff that they were pulling. She, uh, the. Uh, Judge asked them, "You mean to tell me if somebody pulled into a, a Dunkin' Donuts parking lot and uh, did some sort of drug deal, and the people in the uh, Dunkin' Donuts saw them doing it, they could take the property?" And she says, "Oh yeah, yeah." She says, "But there is this innocent owner clause that they they have, which is fine, but it, they don't. What they don't tell you is it costs you thousands of dollars to hire a lawyer to use the thing." In my case, I spent $100,000, I had to take a loan out for most of it when this thing first started. And the Institute for Justice came along and learned how ridiculous this case was. And they, they came on board to help me for nothing. And, and we totally won the case and uh, they had to pay us back. I got my money back and the Institute for Justice got their money back. So it cost the state, I'm guessing, uh, state and federal, I'm guessing they must have spent at least as much as we did. So it cost them over a million dollars for this stuff. I think they're just not used to people fighting back. They're used to just bowling over people with all this vagueness. That's basically so the way the whole thing the Institute for Justice get the money back to? They work off donations. Mm -hmm. They're in Arlington, Virginia. And um, they deal with this stuff, government overreach and, and all of this type of thing. They, they really know what they're doing. It's worth looking on their website, it's just ij.org. And there's all kinds of information on there about this stuff. But these forfeiture laws, I mean, I don't know the ins and outs of every little part of them, but they are, in a lot of, they're great in, in some places, as long as they use them in the way that, you know, taking stuff from drug dealers, but they're using them to steal property from people like me that have done absolutely nothing. I'm certainly glad it worked out all right. Yeah, for three and a half years, you just ripped out of your life because of this crap. Are there any questions?
Thank you very much for okay. taking the time to come up here. We even had to take a call. Yeah. <laughs> Not a big deal. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. The chair recognizes uh, Kevin Close, who is in support of the bill. Representing the New Hampshire Liberty Alliance, is planning to speak for less than two minutes. Yes, indeed, I will. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Uh, I'm not going to read this uh, page, and I'm going to try to even skip other things that are on it because um, I don't want to repeat what other people have said. But the New Hampshire Liberty Alliance, my name is Kevin Bloom, I represent the New Hampshire Liberty Alliance, and um, I'm here to speak in support of HB 1609. As you know, it's bipartisan, it's a pro-liberty bill, and also I am going to just repeat the one line that this may be one of the most important bills that you hear all year because that's, uh, it's important. Um, I'm going, I'm going to tell you just a little story. You did hear from um, one of the other um, witnesses testifying that the drug war is the cause of asset forfeiture. Well, that's not true. Actually, it began during the witchcraft trials, where if you refused to be in a witch, they got your property. So the king would collect if you were being charged with witchcraft. Then, again, before the Revolutionary War, the British used uh, civil asset forfeiture to take property from people who had it. And the charge was smuggling, so that was used against the colonists. If they had money, and they were found with money, then they could be charged with smuggling, and their assets were charged. This is a unique thing about civil asset forfeiture. you got to remember, there are two things. There's, there's uh, criminal and civil. We, uh, the New Hampshire Liberty Alliance does not oppose criminal asset forfeiture, where there's been a charge and a conviction. What we oppose is a situation where someone has had their property taken from them with no charges, made it all. The Institute for Justice estimates that the average forfeiture is between $1,000 and $1,500. It stopped, people are stopped in their cars. Any, it could happen to any of you going home. They're asked if they have any money. They say yes. Um, an officer takes the money and says, well, we suspect that you got this uh, through, through drug dealing. Uh, it might amuse you to know that almost 100% of the currency in the United States is contaminated with cocaine. Just from being mixed around all the other money. In any case, um, due process requires That's an appropriate... That's why we need money laundering. <laughs> <laughs> and yet, that's illegal too. What can you do? Um, so, back to the Revolutionary War thing. Civil asset forfeiture is the reason for the Fourth Amendment. It's why we have the Fourth Amendment to the Constitution that, uh, with its pro uh, prohibitions on um, asset seizure without due process. But due process uh, requires an appropriate legal procedure. It includes prior notice, right to be heard by a neutral decision maker, and um, that's the way we want to want to see it go. Uh, the New Hampshire Constitution also contains provisions uh, regarding the rights of the accused: Article 14, Article 15, Article 17, Article 18, Article 19, Article 20. All of these are violated by civil asset forfeiture, in our opinion. And I would like to ask you to please help to restore the rights of the people of New Hampshire and a vote ought to pass on HB 1609. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your testimony. Are there any questions? If not, thank you again. And the chair recognizes Kurt McNeil, representing the Hampshire Compassion. Hello, everybody. <clears throat> Madam Chair, members of the committee, I represent New Hampshire Compassion. We're the group that worked a lot on the medical marijuana law. Um, we have absolutely nothing to do with heroin, sorry. <laughs> um, except that sometimes these things get caught up together in, in the same sort of thing. I won't repeat any of the things that you've heard before. What I want to say is this. Right now, it is law in New Hampshire that a jury can nullify uh, a law if they deem it to be un unjust. The reason that I'm here and the reason that I'm representing New Hampshire Compassion today is because right now we're in a situation where Medical marijuana patients have had a law passed in their favor, but as the wheels of government do turn slowly, there is as yet no process for them to get a card or receive their medication, even though it's been said that they will eventually be allowed to do so. One of the things that we see in other states, this hasn't occurred yet in New Hampshire, is that someone under those circumstances may decide that since they're in the last few months of their life anyway, or since they're undergoing very harsh treatments, it's worth their while to go ahead and procure marijuana or some, uh, so that they can treat their condition. 
Under these circumstances in other states, juries often nullify the law. They nullify the conviction. They say that this person isn't guilty of a crime because there is a law in place that would make them innocent if they only had, yes ma'am? This bill is civil forfeiture, Indeed. not criminal Indeed. forfeiture, but civil, and the marijuana debate is being continued down the hall and raising me. I understand. Let's so, help me understand the connection of what you're saying to this bill. Because this bill says that you need a criminal conviction, not a civil conviction, and jury nullification has the ability to affect the criminal process, but not the civil process. The, to, to sum it all up, I know everyone's tired of being here. Uh, no, no, no one's saying, okay. We, we, <laughs> the people who had to leave have left because they have other commitments. Okay. We're paying attention. Everybody's to, paying attention. To sum it up, no one's saying that assets, as the gentleman from the Police Chiefs Association, the assets that are a product of ill-gotten gains cannot be forfeited. We're simply asking that they be proved that way before they are forfeited. That's the, that is my summation there. I heard ill-gotten gains used so many times, and no one's saying that ill-gotten gains can't be forfeited. We just like that proved in a criminal court of law. And that is the thrust of my testimony. Are there any other questions? Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Re Representative Birch, have Representative Warden is still here. Are there questions that you have that have not been answered that you would like to ask of Representative Warden? Uh, thank you for the opportunity, but I will be glad to release Representative Warden. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I think Representative Warden could handle any question. <laughs> I'm not worried about that. No, no more. Does anyone have any questions for the the prime sponsor? Um, I will mention if, if you all want to do a, a subcommittee, you know, my research staff and I will be happy to work out some of these details, and we want to make the best product possible. Thank you. Thank you very much. Does anyone else here who has not spoken on House Bill uh, 1609 who would like to speak? If there's anyone here who wants to register um, their position but not speak, there's a blue sheet. Okay, I'm going to close the hearing on 1609. Um,